Uh, any questions on the previous material? We talked about frequency tables, relative frequency tables, and uh, cumulative frequency tables. Now, it's just a real quick review. Why would I use a relative frequency table versus a frequency table? What kinds of situations? Van Dunen? Van Dunen? Van Dunen? Yes. Um, I guess that a relative frequency table is more like a uh, uh, average, right? That's not exactly average. It's, it means percentages or proportions. Okay. So um, I guess that you could use a, a relative frequency table to like, uh, <coughs> compare maybe something with a higher number of samples to a lower number of samples. Yeah, there, you're, you're on to it. If I want to compare two <laughs> samples of vastly different sizes, I can't just use a frequency table. And the example I believe I use in the class is as if I was studying heights of students and I took uh, Cadet Corps 1500 and Virginia Tech 15,000. Use the same class definitions. I really can't compare one with the other, can I? Because the counts are so much larger than Virginia Tech. How could I compare them? Go to relative frequency and then look at percentages or proportions. So keep in mind that the appropriate technique for the question that you're being asked. Anything else on Wednesday's material? Going once, twice? All right. Today is all about graphs and pictures. And you're going to see a lot of them. Uh, I'll go through them pretty quickly because I'm not as concerned that you know how to create these different statistical graphs. We've got tools that do that. No one does it by hand anymore. I'm much more interested that you know how to interpret them, you can recognize them, and you know how to interpret them. And hopefully time remaining here, we'll, we'll go through a lot of that. Give you a chance to critique. But first things first, histograms are just visual representations of frequency tables. And just like I had three flavors of frequency tables, you've got three flavors of histograms. Frequency table, the corresponding histogram. My classes now are down on the x-axis. And you can see the class boundaries, the upper and lower. And graphically, the height of each bar is proportional to the frequency. And that's it. It's just a visual representation instead of, instead of, a, of a table of numbers. And it just so happens we human beings are really good at some things. And among those things we're good at is visually processing information. We're really good at distinguishing colors and sizes and areas. And that can be to an advantage. <coughs> you see later, actually, that can be used to mislead people in statistics. We have to be careful. But in the histogram, there's no doubt when you look at that, you immediately get the picture. Oh, there's a lot of them here. And it's very easy to see the shape of the distribution, which is something we'll talk a lot about, the shape of a distribution. The previous one was a frequency histogram. You can have a relative frequency histogram. Same idea. There's the table, and there's the diagram. The heights of the bars are proportional to the values in the corresponding table. All right, just a little bit about shapes of distributions. One of the more common distributions that we all are familiar with and talk about, you're going to become very familiar with it, is the normal distribution of the bell-shaped curve. And it has a very precise mathematical definition we're not going to be bothered by that for a while. Right now, I want you to think big picture. What does the shape of a belt of a normal distribution look like if I look at it using a histogram? Well, in general, it would be have a peak in the middle. 
it would be very low at either end, and it would be kind of symmetrical. So you can imagine overlaying a bell-shaped curve on this histogram. You can see, well, it, it might fit. It's pretty crude at this point, isn't it? You'd want to have, if you have enough data, you'd go with smaller uh, class widths, and you'd see that fit the curve better and better. But that's important because later on, you'll see that some of the statistical techniques we use require the distribution of the data that we're studying to be normal. So we need to be able to recognize normal distributions. And one of the ways to recognize them is their shape, the shape of their distribution. But that's not all the possible shapes we can have. Uh, let's talk about skewedness. And this uh, terminology can get confusing. This is the way I think it's easiest to understand. That's my original distribution. If I grab a hold of it in the tail on the right and yank it to the right, what would it look like? Well, it would look something like this. And that's skewed. <coughs> On the other hand, if I have this original symmetric distribution, and I grab a hold of its left tail, yank on the left, what would this shape look like? Well, it'd be like that, and it's skewed left. And there are lots of important distributions out there that are skewed left to right. Again, the shape of the distribution is important because, uh, especially in chapter three, when we start talking about statistics like means and medians, the shape of the distribution changes where those occur in the distribution. Now, let me give you a quick example, and then we'll, we'll get back to this more in chapter three. But imagine this is the, the mean of that distribution, the average, the central. What happens when I skew it right, when I grab a hold of it and pull it to the right? What happens to the mean? Where does it go? Yeah, it goes to the right, doesn't it? So it's going to move out here some. Point in example, if you ever listen to the Bureau of Labor Statistics when they give their monthly reports or quarterly reports, they'll talk about things like family income, or family wealth, or per capita this or that. What statistic do they use? They don't use the mean. Why not? Well, the distribution of incomes is skewed to the right. You can't earn less than zero. There's a whole bunch of us muddling around in the middle, but there's a lot of people just keeps going to the right and the right and the right, eventually run into Bill Gates, and you just keep going and going, right? It's skewed right. If you know the distribution you're working with, you'll use different statistics to, to describe it more accurately. That's the big picture to take for now. We'll come back. Here are some other shapes of distributions. That, that would be the normal. This is called a uniform distribution. I call it the shoebox or the rectangle. And believe it or not, there are some physical things out there in the world that are distributed this way. This would be a skewed right and a skewed left. Okay, got the big picture? Any photographers in the class? Anybody have a digital SLR? No? All right. To me, this was a great example when I was Googling for images with histogram of the power of presenting data graphically. The histogram, uh, when you take a picture, is the distribution of the, the amount of light in different frequencies. I think I got my physics right. Basically, to the left it means you've got dark things. To the right, you've got really light stuff. And this is spread over the whole image. <laughs> so when I look at this histogram, if I was taking a picture, and in a DLSR, you can 
asked to show you the histogram. Now, if I see my histogram here, I see I've probably underexposed it. Now, even not being a, a photography geek or a physics guy that understand histograms of frequencies of light and all that, it really tells the story, doesn't it? I can see that, oh, it's way over here. I change an f-stop and I get more exposure and I, my distribution moves to the right. And if I have too many stops, then I go that way. All right? Frequency distributions histograms have a lot of applications. I guess that's the take home for that. Here's one we can have fun with. All right. The first, uh, first of many exercises for you to uh, put your skills at work. What are you looking at? Interpret it. And can you critique it at all? Okay. First of all, what are we looking at? What kind of statistical display? Right, relative. It's a relative, relative hist histogram. Yeah, based on a relative frequency too. How did he know it was relative? How did you know that? Percentages. Yeah. yeah, that's key. I'm looking at percentages. So I would expect if I added the value of the blue bars, I should get 100. All right. So got an idea of what we're looking at. Yes, because maybe uh, skewed, right? Yeah, it is kind of skewed, right? And what am I looking at? The net worth of members of the <coughs> Senate or the House of Representatives. So I can't get less than zero. Well, can I get less than zero? I suppose with your house nowadays, you could be less than zero. But you could go way, way out to the right. Okay. Now it's representing two samples at once. This is a fairly common technique. Two bars side by side, and they did it by political affiliation. And the traditional color is blue and red. Okay. So give me a quick interpretation of that. If Fox News puts the mic in front of you, right? It said <coughs> Petruco, what can you tell me about the distribution of wealth amongst the parties in the Congress? Right. Look at that. Okay. That is um, it's relatively even. It is, isn't it? Between. Now we've got our stereotype images of Republican versus Democrat and so on, you know. But at least for members of Congress, it's pretty similar. But the only place it jumps out is here. All right, but I may, I had a, a very important uh, caveat there. What population are we talking about? Hello. Members of, yeah, Senate House Representatives. Does this necessarily represent the distribution of net worth for all Americans by political affiliation? Probably not, right? I can't, I don't know exactly how different it would be, but my guess is that's not a very random sample of the population up there in Washington, D.C. Okay, all right, so you've got some basic skills. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over this <coughs> point. Just remember that it exists I wouldn't expect you to uh, use it. I made the point that normal distributions are important because uh, we've got lots of statistical tools to work with them. So the question you might ask is, well, how do I know if the distribution is normal? Go ahead and ask that. I don't know if the distribution is normal. You know, one of the ways you could know is by doing a quantile plot. Now, don't ask about quantile plot because I don't want to go into those details. Just know that there are ways to test to see if the distribution is normal. Because the normal is a really important shape of a distribution. <laughs> All right. So much for histograms. It's a little bit of a blitz screen here. Other ways to graphically display statistical information. And you've seen some of these before. Maybe you haven't. I'm going to go through quickly and kind of give you the pros and cons of each one, which is what I would expect you to know as a 
educated consumer or quantitative information. Right? When would I use one or the other? In some cases, it's just a matter of personal preference. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. In a scatter plot, we use it when we have pairs of numerical data values. In this case, uh, I have pairs of values that, that represent a person's waist circumference and their arm circumference. Okay? Think of it as an x and y value, pair of coordinates. And I can plot those. Each dot represents a pair of <coughs> associated values. And I can look at the pattern. And that's about all I'm doing in a scatter plot. When you move on to 106, toward the end of it, you use this a lot in regression analysis to get started. You just look for trends. Is there a trend between the x's and the y's? Well, just eyeballing that, is there a trend with these data values? Does this scatter plot suggest something? Yes. Is it yes? Yes. What's it suggest? That it has the weight of your circumference, so does the arm circumference. Yeah. I mean, surprise. <laughs> I don't think we can publish and get a Nobel Prize for this, but I think what he's referring to is you can imagine drawing a line through there. You know, we, in one of those we study regression analysis, that's exactly what we'll be doing. And it kind of suggests that as weight circumference goes up, arm circumference also goes up. And that's what you're using the scatter plots for, to see what kind of trends exist. They're usually the first step to do further analysis. They kind of point the direction for you. Time series graph, it's your x-axis is time. It's like a scatter plot with the x values being time. What's happening over time? Some data naturally lends itself to that. That is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It stops at 200, 2006. If they went to 2008, 9, and 10, you can see a very different trend. I don't know how your portfolios are doing now. You're not affected by it? A dot plot. All right, let's think back of what to the histogram. What's the potential weakness of a histogram? Well, we've deliberately taken a big pile of data and summarized it in classes, maybe five, seven, nine, a small number of classes. So we really compressed the information heavily. We've distilled it. So that's got a strong feature in that, all right, now I can get my head around it and I can see trends. What's the downside? Well, I've tossed out some data, haven't I? If you really wanted to see all your data values, then instead of a histogram, you'd do a dot plot. Each dot represents a data value. And I can see I had one, I had 70 occur once. I had 80 occur one, two, three times. And then as I come across other occurrences of that data value, I just put another dot on the top. So I still get this representation of height meaning something. It's the frequency in this case. But now I get to see all the data values. They're all there. It's a little bit harder, perhaps, to see trends, but you've really gotten out the microscope, have your magnifying glass, and you're looking down at individual data values. A stem plot or a stem and leaf plot. I have to admit, you'd have to be a statistics nerd to love this. I suppose I should be prejudiced if you against it. But it's not the easiest one to read. Here's how you do it. If you weren't even happy with the dot plot that showed you all the data graphically, if you insisted, I want to see all the data and I want to see the values all at once, you might use a stem and leaf plot. Uh, these values are back to IQs, remember, so they range from about 50 to 140. The way you read it, is the digits to the left of this bar, that's the stem, that's the first one or two digits of the IQ score. That zero would mean I had one IQ of 50. That six would mean I had another IQ of 56. 
so there were two data values, two IQ scores in the, 50, in the 50s. And out here, say for example, this would mean I had an IQ score of 120, 125, and 128. Now, my personal take is these are good for limited audiences. You would put this in a US, uh, 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 in a, a weekly newspaper or on the Fox News. It's, it's too technical, isn't it? You'd have to explain it. But if you're writing a scholarly argue, uh, article, it might be appropriate. A bar graph. Well, a bar graph looks a lot like a histogram, but here's the difference. I'm working with qualitative data instead of quantitative. Remember, in the histogram, it's quantitative data because I'm doing class width, lowest to the largest. I have to be able to order my values. In a bar graph, I could be looking at qualitative data, like in this case, it's just male, female. Or I could be dividing up by ethnicity or by color of hair. Anyway, I want to group them up. That's qualitative. And these would be, well, what you display is optional. In this case, it's the median income of this group. So in 1950, that was the median income of males and females. And you can see over the years. Okay. A Pareto chart. It's just a bar graph. This guy got his name attached to something for pretty easily. All this is a bar graph where I've reordered the bars so that the tallest are first and then they go into semi order. Why? Well, since it's qualitative data, the relative position of these doesn't have meaning as it did in a histogram, does it? In a histogram, I just can't move the bars around because those bars represent slices of quantitative values. But here I can move them around. And it just makes a, a higher impact. Immediately I can see that, oh, this is the most important one, and then they decrease like this. I'm sure you've all seen pie charts. <coughs> Qualitative data, slices of the pie should add up to 100. The human eye is very good at discerning colors and sizes. So right away, this really jumps out at you, doesn't it? Now that's good, but it can be bad, too, because your eye is seeing something in two dimensions, isn't it? You're seeing an area. You're seeing this big, big purple area. But my numbers I'm looking at are of one dimension. Uh, think about this for a minute. I think I have an example. But why you have to be very cautious about using some of these graphic techniques. Suppose the underlying values are 2 and 4. If I do a bar graph, One is twice as tall as the other. And your eye picks that up. Well, what if someone, and you, you see this, said, well, gee, two, two dimensions is nice, but three dimensions would be really cool. So the underlying number is two and four. And what I'm going to do is draw, you can see I'm challenged, a cube whose each side is two cube over here where each side is four. <laughs> well, what's the problem here? What does your eye see? If these were re decent graphics. What does your eye see? Yes. It sees that it's been doubled size-wise. 
Yeah, it's actually, if it's two by two by two, that's two times four, that's eight. The area there is eight. And the area here is just, uh, well, this would be four times four times four. 16, that'd be 64. And here it's just two times two is eight. It's a factor of eight in volume, but it's only a factor of two in the real numbers. So that's misleading. Your eye sees that, and you see, wow, what a big difference. You know, the underlying numbers, there's not that big a difference. So that can be used to exaggerate statistics. A frequency polygon. A frequency polygon is just taking a histogram and making a straight line plot of it. And what you do is you go to these numbers are the midpoints of your classes. And you're doing a connect the dots. So if I had my histogram, it looked like this. Say there's a point, there's a point, there's a point, and then I I connect the dots. Another visual representation. Can anybody think of a reason why that might be misleading? Where could this go wrong? A lot of people standing today. It must have been a long week. I commend you that. The previous class, no one was standing. They were just had their chin on their chest. Where could this mislead me, potentially? What's it suggesting when I see lines? Yes. It looks a lot like it's displayed there over time. Okay, could suggest that. In that case, that wouldn't be true. What else do lines suggest when you look at them? Yes. That they're related? They're related? That it's all continuous, right? That yeah. they're, it's smooth transition from here to here. Yeah, is that the case with the data? We don't know that. Just recognize the strengths and the weaknesses of the technique you use. And if you're a consumer, recognize the strengths and weaknesses. And you can have frequency polygons, relative frequency polygons, and an O guide is. I think I pronounced that correct. It's just a cumulative relative frequency polygon. Lots of options, right? Okay, now let's, let's have some fun. You get a chance to be a critic. Let's go over examples of misleading statistics. And one of the common techniques is misrepresenting scale. This histogram and this histogram are based on the same numbers. Now, if you just look at it with your eyes quickly and don't look at the scales, what do your eyes tell you? The difference between those two. What your eyes tell you? Yes? I will say is that the, in the first graph it uh, shows the Toyota Camry as being much lower than the other two, while the uh, second graph shows it as being e almost equal. Yeah, your eye, your eyes are, and your brain are very good at detecting color and area. And look at that. That's, those are big differences. Your first impression is, oh, there's a big difference. But is there? What did we start at here? We started at 30, and we started our scale 30 to 36. <coughs> Well, wait a minute. If I start my scale at zero, and these are the same numbers, right? The same numbers for your previous histogram. Now look at them. What image does your eye give you? What impression? Okay, keys. Oh, they're the same. Yeah, big deal. It's not that different. And with probably with just three numbers, you know, you really shouldn't even bother to do a histogram. Just put, just type out three numbers. It's probably overkill in this case. Uh, you can see examples of this trick used a lot depending on what claim the person is trying to, to make. Pictographs. These can be a lot of fun. 
uh, USA Today is famous for that. <coughs> Look at that. What? I guess it's kind of a bar graph. We have qualitative data, depending on your degree. And it looks like this is your some kind of income. Mean income, median income, whatever. But they've got a little bit too cute with it, haven't they? First of all, the bars have the same width. They should be separated to make it visually clear of the different categories. And you're trying to, to, with all this, your eye is, I know, is moving around there. You know what that is, but your eye, you can't help it, is wandering around there and seeing all that elaborate design. It's detracting from the display of information. It's not any value. All right, here's a much better example of the one that I was done with. From 18 to 74, that's a, a factor of four. But does your eye see this as being four times bigger than this? No. Very misleading. Be immediately suspicious when statistical data is represented, pictographs, three dimensions, when it's just a single number. The author suggests this is a fair, accurate representation of the information you saw earlier. We start the scale at zero. All right? Don't cheat and start it halfway up. We have separation between the, the uh, this is a bar chart, so these are the different categories. And the heights are truly represent, representative or proportional to the number that we're looking at. It doesn't exaggerate it or it doesn't understate it. Uh, it'd be worth reviewing this list of important uh, principles to be applied when you're looking at statistics. I'm going to give you a chance now to take your chop at some statistics. These are ones that I just found over the internet or in other articles. Based on what we've learned, first of all, identify what's being displayed. Now, sometimes these are going to be conglomerations of several, several styles, and you get to be the critic now. Is it a good example of a statistical graph? What could be improved? What's potentially wrong with it? Who's got an idea in this one? Yes, Matt Griffin. Each circle is a different size, so it kind of looks like some are larger than others, even though they're like in the same bracket, I guess. Size of circle represents employment. But it goes, it only goes one way. Shouldn't it go both ways also? Should what go both ways? Should the circle be bigger moving that way and that way? Moving up and to the right? Oh, up here? Yes. Well, this is saying, my interpretation is, we've got a lot of people registered nurses, and the size is, is the employment size. A lot of people working as registered nurses, and they're earning, and this is, to me, is one of the things that's confusing. What are they earning? I mean, here's this big circle. What are they earning? That keys? You really can't tell what they're earning, because you don't know where, like, the exact point is. It's just like, <coughs> kind of like a range. It's not really like it could be. You're not sure, are you? You, know, you might think, well, it's probably, I take the center of that, and I go over here, and that's the uh, average annual selling, perhaps. What's another, uh, something else we could mention? We just talked about this. What about those circles? How many dimensions? One, two. Two, two dimensions. What's the data behind it? single number. All right, so that's a slight exaggeration. And they're trying to represent two pieces of information on one graph, which can be nice, but it also can be tricky.
All right. This proves without a doubt that old people are good drivers. Gee, youngsters are causing all the accidents, right? Look at that. How can you deny it? A lot of this. Uh, yeah, could they, um, compare the amount of people that are actually driving between the age groups. Like, there's probably more people on the road between the ages of 20 and 24 than there are like, greater than 79 years old. All right. Sound reasonable? Yeah, you don't know that, do you? This is just number of uh, drivers in fatal crashes. Okay, so it looks like as you, the older you get, the safer you are. Well, what I don't know is a couple things. I don't know how many old people are driving or how much they're driving. Let's look at the same data. But now, I'm looking at fatal crashes per miles driven. A little bit different, isn't it? What's the story here? Well, these are the safe drivers. Yes, the youngsters are still, we, we know that. But on the other hand, a lot of fatalities in the same. Same data, just a, a different, more accurate presentation, isn't it? He caught that. That's good. Um, that is presenting uh, literacy rates around the world. So it's called a pictograph. What's going on there that might be good, might be not so good? Yes, sir. It goes up each country. Let's go up the like, regions of the country. Because not everybody in the U.S. is that. Okay, it's an average across all of U.S. or all of Russia. Yeah, if it's one number for 200 and some million people, 300, all right. What are some other possible uh, weaknesses? Population, education levels, <coughs> schools in the area. Okay, uh, follow the thought of population. What is actually considered literate in what language? Because there may be different languages throughout the region. All right, that's a valid point too. If I was talking to the author of this and say, "Well, how do you do you measure literacy the same in each country?" Okay, some other really fundamental ones. No, it's coloring the size of the country, but that's not necessarily related to the population. So a country that may be larger may have less of a literacy rate. Excellent point. What does your eye see? You see color and space area. You pick that up real quickly, don't you? So you see a big swamp of purple. Look at all those people in Siberia. Aren't they literate? And China, well, that's a pretty good size, but compared to Australia, yeah, but there's no sense of population. And yet there's one other subtle but really important distortion in this. What about maps? You smile. You got it. What is it? Well, they're two-dimensional. Oh, yeah, a two-dimensional depiction of something that is. What kind of distortion do I have in maps? Locator projection. Yeah, the the land masses, depending on the type of projection, but the most common one, the, the ones down low look larger than either low or at the top for the poles. They look larger than the ones in the middle. So is Australia really as big as China? No. That's yet another distortion of this. But it's a pretty egregious uh, example. All right. There's some more interesting ones. I'll say those. This is a teaser. We're back Monday. We'll go some more. Have a good weekend. Thank you.